clear night. Boy, there is the Pleiades, the seven little sisters up in the sky near Mars. And there are you here with me, Stargazer Mark, to stay curious here at the American Space Museum as we bring you Star Curious on our video podcast today. Thank you for joining us. Marty Winkle, my cameraman, co-producer here for almost 700 episodes we've done, Marty. How are you? We're outside in our backyard here. You got your jacket on. And uh, we're going to look at a meteor shower today and talk about that. How you doing, Marty? Doing good, Mark. How are you doing? Good. You sound good on the on our UCAC brothers microphone there. And uh, I am dressed up to be outdoors in my backyard to share a little backyard astronomy with you today. We're going to talk about three planets and all these bright stars being like a holiday lights in the sky right from your own very backyard. Even in light polluted skies, you're going to be able to see a lot of three planets and, and a bunch of bright stars. And we're going to talk about that as we go along here with Stay Curious today. Being an amateur astronomer like I have for over 50 years is 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 something that that you decide you that you're an amateur astronomer. You get a little uh, a star chart, a red flashlight, so you can see it, and your eyes not uh, go uh, back to being uh, dilated uh, or contracted after being dilated outside. And I didn't bring my red flashlight, but uh, you can have a lot of fun in your backyard just learning the names and constellations, and a lot of them are based on mytholo mythological creatures, Roman and Greek mythology, and a lot of the names up there are from the Arabics. The Arabian astronomers named so many of these stars that we still keep the names with. So, uh, and as I say some of these names throughout our episode today, you'll see that, yes, they have a, a, uh, a Middle East uh, type of uh, origination to them. So uh, we'll stick tight here. We're going to take you up into the sky here, but there's a lot of space news going on. And on Stay Curious, even when we're star curious, we want to keep you up to date what's going on on a day-by-day -day basis. And what's going to happen this Saturday, Marty, is we are going to have a special Christmas auction December 3rd, Saturday at noon here in the American Space Museum in beautiful downtown Titusville or online. There's only 115 items. Marty, you've checked them out, haven't you? There's some cool stuff on there. Yeah. Uh, there is a very rare um, um, certificate, uh, driver certificate uh, sort of made up for the crawler. Uh, there's a very rare remove before flight ribbon off of a snark missile and there is an 11 by 14 visor shot of buzz aldrin on the moon that's we call that the visor shot because neil armstrong and the lunar model number five eagle is seen in the visor uh, other items that'll be on there uh, can include uh, a picture of walt disney looking through a periscope at one of the launch pads. There's a signed uh, Gemini 6 and 7 photograph. Uh, press badges from the great Mary Bubb, one of the first female reporters at the Space Coast. And if you want to own a flag from one of the six orbiters, yes, six, Enterprise was our important um, uh, landing uh, and test of the uh, Enterprise uh, that didn't go to space, but is very instrumental in practice in the landings. Anyway, you can own one of these. Uh, Marty, you told me those sold for about 40 bucks in the commissary back in the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're all going to go for around $200. So you can bid early. Go to our website. At the top is auctions. You click that. There is the auction tab. It'll take you. You can register to make bids now, starting at noon. Uh, and... Orion sent this picture back uh, when it was furthest away. It is about, and uh, now the moon on average is 240,000 miles away. That is the moon and the earth, of course. And the camera is on one of the solar panels of Orion. And of course, we're looking at the service module built by ESA. And uh, I don't know, Marty, you like seeing the worm logo there? Or would you rather see the meatball? I'd rather see a meatball, but it lays out better. 
It does. It looks do. cool along there, uh, the, the skirt there of the, the uh, Orion spacecraft. Well, Orion is set to return to Earth on December 11th with a record uh, heat re-entry and a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. So December 11th, Marty, I'm trying to look on the wall. That's a Sunday. That would be an exciting Sunday. Uh, so we look forward to that. It's halfway through. And, you know, <clears throat> I'm involved in amateur astronomy. That's why we're doing some stargazing today on Stay, Stay Star Curious. But uh, an amateur astronomer in Italy named uh, uh, Gilanto Ma Massi rented time on the virtual telescope in a facility in Italy and took this picture of Orion uh, and Marty it's right in the center there you got it buddy that is the Orion spacecraft among stars that are being trailed uh, 268,000 miles away the telescope tracked Orion's apparent motion this is why stars look like long trails while the while the probe is a sharp dot of light so the spacecraft is only five meters wide okay that's 15 feet in diameter and it's like a 16th magnitude star, which I cannot see a 16th magnitude star, even with a telescope in my backyard. You really need a big telescope and a dark sight. So in that interesting, Marty, people everywhere want to keep track of the Orion spacecraft. And here is the deepest shot you'll ever see of it there. So imagine when it were rated with humans and humans going back to the moon. Uh, that would be cool to think about a crew of four or five on that. <clears throat> well, we want to give you a shot of what's inside of Orion. Yeah, they, they lit up the lights. They've got anatomical dummies in there. I think they've got a, a Snoopy doll that's floating around in there looking out the windows. And this is a experiment called Callisto that is being... This Callisto uh, is uh, to help with tracking, communications... Uh, on the deep space network. So this is actually testing electronics that they want to use for the voyage to Mars. And after all, isn't that what Orion and, and the Artemis program is all about, is going to Mars? And we're not going to go to Mars in Orion. In fact, Orion's just the Uber to the, to the, the gateway space station. And what we're going to the moon in is the Elon Musk Blue Origin starship that looks like from all those, those spaceship out of those science fiction movies of the 50s. That's what we're landing on the moon and Mars in. But this is a very important spacecraft. Apparently everything's going great. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting. They got a nice uh, purple cast in there uh, to set the mood a little bit, Marty, up there in space. So uh, very active. They're halfway through. December 11th will be the splashdown. And stay curious. We'll update you more about what has been a nominal Artemis mission, and we love to hear the word nominal. That means normal. That means everything is just the way they have it in their their launch uh, manuals and books, and 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 uh, uh, not just the launch manuals, but the mission manuals on there. So, well, we are going to talk now about the only time in history, Marty. How many times do you think a human being's hit been hit by a, a shooting star? or a meteor one time marty says one time what do you th say dave stangy you think it's been more than one person hit by a meteorite now space debris is a meteoroid as it's going through space and when it's coming through the sky like this time exposure of the gemini meteor shower they're called meteors but when they're laying on the ground and we pick them up they're a meteorite all right and on this date, in I got to look up the exact uh, town there. Uh, oh, Marty, I left that over there. Would you hand me that November 30th folder on the floor there? What you're going to see is uh, uh, Dorothy Hodges, who's been hit by a meteor. And uh, thank you, sir. And uh, Ann Hodges was hit by a meteor uh, on November 30th, 1950. How about that? 68 years ago in Slyakauga, Slyakauga, S-Y-L-A-C-A-U-G-A, Slyakauga, Miami. 
Ann Hodges was napping on her couch at about two in the afternoon. Hey, you know, Carlton Bailey naps at two in the afternoon. So, you know, why not uh, have Ann Hodges napping at two in the afternoon? She's covered by quilts when a softball sized hunk of black rock broke through the ceiling, bounced off a radio and hit her in the thigh, leaving what they call a pineapple shaped bruise. Anne's story is particularly rare because most meteorites usually fall in the ocean or, 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 or you know, land that's uh, out in the, the boondocks. After all, 70% of the earth is ocean. Uh, but uh, it slammed into her living room uh, in this small Alabama town. Uh, people in town during the day reported seeing a bright reddish light like a Roman candle trailing smoke. And uh, there is a web publication, The Day the Meteorite Fell in Slyakauga. And in the, the Alabama Museum of Natural History is a portion of that rock and uh, shown here. Now, this rock broke into two pieces. It was about eight pounds, all right, when it burst through the roof there. That would hurt you. That's why she's got a big bruise there. They actually say it was 2.46 p.m. local time. And uh, she's 31 years old at the time, okay? And um, Anne later suffered a nervous breakdown. It is said that she never really got over this in 1954. And she got divorced in 1964, and she died uh, 18 years later after this happened of kidney failure uh, at age 52. So God bless her. But she goes down in history forever, uh, does Ann Hodges as being the only human being to have been struck by a meteorite or a meteor when it hit her, and then it was a meteorite laying on the ground there. Now, Marty, if I would have... Uh, 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 if this meteorite, it doesn't talk about this. This was 1954, and I've tried to find more. Let's say that crashes through, it's, it's in interstellar space. It goes through the Earth's atmosphere at 30,000 miles an hour. It burns up quickly, but it's so big at eight pounds that it, it, it busts through the, the house and lands there. If you picked it up, how do you think it would feel to touch, Marty, temperature-wise? I would think it would be hot. You would think it would be hot. But I'm here to tell you, it was probably getting covered with frost as it would actually be cold because it had been cold for millions of years out there in interstellar interplanetary space. And just that brief, very brief three or four seconds that it crashed through the Earth's atmosphere would not take all that heat away. And when it landing there that big, it probably had frost covering it there. So, uh We've not have not had the opportunity to, to see that, but I do know some people who have witnessed uh, or read about people who witnessed actual falls and go up to them minutes afterwards, and there's frost around it. So, uh, but it could be hot if it was very small. Now, meteors, meteorites, meteoroids. Well, a bunch of meteoroids from a storm called the Geminid storm, which is part of an asteroid named Phaeton is going to happen next weekend. In fact, Wednesday night is the peak of what is called and known as the Geminid meteor shower. And that's what we have on our green screen here is a time exposure. And then they, they also put uh, different uh, frames together to show you more than one meteor because it's hard to get more meteor in one frame or meteorite. Well, the Geminid shower is always one of the year's best, okay? And it is called that because it seems to radiate out of the constellation Gemini, the twins, which is right below where Mars is. There you see Orion on the right, and I'm going to be showing you some charts like this in a moment of our sky in our backyard. So, though the moon is going to be pretty bright, all right, uh, it'll be in the sky after midnight, uh, rising locally about 11 o'clock on December 14th, you will it'll make the faint stars tough to see, meteorites tough to see but you'll see the brighter ones all right without the full the bright moon there geminid meteors are the best meteor shower of the year now some of you may say well the perseid meteor shower of august everybody knows that's the best one it's the most popular one actually and there's a meteor society that for a hundred years has been doing what they call meteor counts. And the, Gem the, the Perseid meteor shower in 
the um, August summertime, you can see about a meteor a minute, maybe about 60 an hour. You're not going to see every minute a meteor. You might see three or four in a meteor in a, a couple of seconds and then two minutes later see five and then, then not see any for 20 minutes. But they average them out. Actually, the Gemini meteor shower is more meteors per hour than the um, Perseid. Why doesn't anybody know about the Gemini meteor shower that happens around December 14th every year? Duh! <laughs> Santa, Santa Claus, the holidays, the Jewish holiday, Kwanzaa, whatever you want to celebrate. Everybody's too involved with the holidays to lay on their back stress-free for an hour or so before sunrise and watch meteors fall. And uh, that's the best time to see is after midnight before sunrise. And uh, I hope that you can catch some meteors next week. We'll remind you about it, of course, on Stay Curious next week. The shower radiant, okay, that, that we're talking about here. Let me back up there. The shower radiant, it's like looking at driving at night in a rainstorm with your headlights or in a snowstorm where the snow looks like it's coming to you from down the road. Though it's all falling straight down and coming from different angles. And that is a perspective uh, illusion that all these are coming from a radiant. We're not in a car looking at snow coming at us or rain. We're on spaceship Earth going through debris that is in our path of our orbit from a asteroid named Phaeton that uh, shrugged some of its debris millions of years ago. We know that because the orbit of all this debris goes right back to this asteroid that happens to be locked in an orbit around the Earth. So hope you enjoy some geminid meteors. We'll remind you to keep looking up next week with that. So Marty, who's watching us today? Give me a shout out. No, you give a shout out to them there. They love to hear your soft voice there. I know it. Anyway, Doug Forrest is watching. It's hey, Doug. Way. Hope everything's good in L.A. for you there, buddy. Yeah, William Whiting and Dave Stange, Tom Usiak, Carlton Bailey, Steve Hammer, and Van, uh, Madeline Vanderlaan. Thank you. Yep. William Whiting, I got your email. Sorry about your fur baby there. He's a rescue bulldog man, I believe he told us. Right, Marty? Uh, his wife's a veteran. William White Whiting? Oh, okay, thought, uh, but uh, anyway, sorry about that, William. And uh, he wants those UCAC, Tom. He wants your photographs that you took up there at the Artemis launch, and I'll forward those to you, uh, Bill. I thought you got them there. But thank you all for watching. Stay curious. Please tell your friends to uh, turn get turned on to it. Here we're we're trying to provide some uh, daily information that you just don't get anywhere else and we actually try to make sure it's facts don't we marty as factual as we can <laughs> so well here's a fun fact we got 13 human beings orbiting the earth right now all right we've got six on the heavenly palace of the chinese Re communist republic and here they are they docked yesterday, three men with uh, the two men and one woman in the middle in the back there. Six Takio knots, they call them, in China. And uh, they are beginning to uh, get this space station up and running. Uh, it looks like this. I don't know, it doesn't look like that. That's ours. It actually looks like this in an artist's rendering. Uh, they have three modules that just got attached to it. The, their spaceships down there at the bottom at the Nader point there it looks like a Soyuz and they may add three more units to this in the next two years but this in 2023 they're supposed to launch a six foot telescope that's going to fly in tandem with the space station and be serviceable maybe from spacewalks uh, but they are going to put an astronomical telescope in the same orbit as their Tangong Heavenly Palace space station but there is our gorgeous space station, been completely occupied for 22 years uh, by human beings. Of course, the solar panels there, the four sets there. Uh, the other white things that you see, Marty, the little tongue sticking out there, those are radiators to expel heat. Uh, all the heat generated by the electronics and experiments and the human environment there. So in case you were wondering. And here's our beautiful crew on Expedition 68 enjoying 
Uh, not sure what they're enjoying. Maybe a co teleconference. Uh, maybe uh, Human Resources has them all together, Marty, for the, the monthly Human Resource uh, uh, <laughs> discussion. Uh, but uh, that is uh, Commander. Uh, there. Um, uh, well, she's the, the uh, Space Ship Commander. Nicole Mann, I recognize her. We got Josh Cassida on there and Frank Rubio of NASA. We've got uh, Ross Cosmos astronauts, Dimitri uh, and Sergi and Anna uh, Krikina. She's the second woman up there. Only the fifth Russian woman to go to space, okay? we've America's had 55 American uh, women go to space. And then we have uh, uh, Kawachi Wakata from Japanese Space Agency there. And, uh, and look at how kind of... All that wires and stuff, Marty. In my reading to, to uh, understand more about the Chinese space station, they have consciously tried to go to wireless networks. You see the walls here. Of course, this is a fresh station, but they purposely have tried to use um, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi type technology to eliminate all of the wires. And that is something that does strike me every time I see things in there. Uh, in the space station is wow you could easily fly through like superman and get tangled up in those wires there so humans orbited earth since 1961 that's the number we've got tallied up 72 women 5522 men and we've got 35 with an asterisk carmonauts is what marty and i call them that have gone above the 62 mile or 100 kilometer Carmen line and that includes about 26 or so uh, Blue Origin Carmenauts uh, uh, all right on there which we interviewed one of them Sarah Sabri and uh, she was one of our such enthusiastic and we love calling her an astronaut if you want to call yourself an astronaut fine by us but when you orbit Earth we put another another number up there so all right, Marty. Well, let's go. Uh, let's go out in the backyard a little bit here. Let's get my tele my my binoculars going here, and I'm looking up there at that W I've outlined is Cassiopeia the Queen. That big square up there is Pegasus the horse. And if you're a Pisces in astrology, it's hard to see your uh, constellation up there. And Aquarius also doesn't have many bright stars, but that's where Jupiter is looking east and this is one month ago when i was out in the dark site and uh how things have changed in a month and i'll show you that in a minute there's looking directly south i've got jupiter marked there in the middle left and saturn is in the lower right there saturn and jupiter at nine o'clock jupiter is almost directly overhead nine o'clock at night though it's going to be dark at seven six o'clock basically it's going to be dark but about seven o'clock there's going to be a red star coming up above the horizon. There's several red stars, but one is the brighter red star, and that's the planet Mars. I want to, Jupiter looks like this in a telescope in many backyards. You can see the stripes of the cloud bands. And you also notice that Jupiter squished a little bit, all right, because it's the largest planet, yet it those cloud bands rotate around the fastest of any in the solar system so fast that it creates a centrifugal bulge making the equator about 800 and eight about 88,000 miles across and from top to bottom poles it's only about 80,000 miles across and of course the Galileo moons three of them shown here uh, you'll see usually four of them that Galileo discovered in 1609 from his own backyard in Tuscany he was at the time. We have a spacecraft, Marty, orbiting uh, Jupiter. It's called Juno, all right, uh, the uh, uh, Greek name for the their god, uh, one of their gods. Uh, Zeus was the other one. And that's the great red spot. And Juno is going around the poles, and it's going about a million miles away from Jupiter, and then it comes down to about 6,000 miles. And yes, that gravity pull of Jupiter makes it the fastest man-made vehicle ever in the solar system. It has hit speeds of over 100,000 miles an hour, I've read. 
Saturn up in the sky, you got to look at Saturn. That is what astronomy is all about. Go be looking at your local astronomy club uh, and find out on their Facebook page when they're doing a stargaze. Ours is doing one this Saturday at the Veterans Memorial. So uh, starting about 4 o'clock, you can come out and see telescopes in the daylight. <clears throat> the Veterans Memorial Center on Merritt Island, we want to see you there to uh, show you Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars, and the moon will be up too. So we're hoping to have a big crowd there. Saturn, whether it's sideways, upside down, there's no upside down or left or right in space, really. But uh, it looks tinier than this in most telescopes, but still you can tell that the rings are there. Well, let's get outside, go have a nice supper, and then go outside about 8, 8.30, Look to the east, okay, in your nice lawn chair with your binoculars and get ready to be mesmerized by the best time of the year to look at all the bright stars. We're billing it as holiday lights in the sky, all right? And there you have Orion is behind me. See the three stars of the belt right there of Orion? And then the two stars here are his knees and the other two stars over there are his shoulders you all see that and this reddish star there is called Betelgeuse and this white star there is called Rigel and they're they're over a thousand light years away yet they're they're so huge and powerful they're pumping out all that energy and looks so bright over here to the far left well let's just turn on the turn on the the uh put the the names up there in the sky Marty over there in the lower left is Gemini the twins with the two bright stars Castor and Pollux and up there in the middle left, left to center, is Mars. And Mars is in a V shape, in the middle of a V shape, that's Taurus the bull. And you see the V shape uh, to the, right in the center at the top. That is the face of the bull. And that red star is the eye of the bull. And that is called Aldebaran. Marty, would you point that out for me, please? That's the red star right in the very middle top. Go up. That is Mars there. That's Mars. Now go to your right. And that is Aldebaran. Up, up, up higher. There you go. Yeah. That whole V thing there, that's the face of Taurus the bull. We actually see his face charging you in the sky. And then go to the left. Above that is the Pleiades. And I'll show you that in a minute. The Seven Sisters. Go to the left and that's Mars. And it's near one of the horns. And then over there to the far left is Auriga, the charioteer. And that bright star is called Capella. And I filled in, there's Capella and a few more names of stars there, okay? I hope you can see it there. Do a screen, screen grab. But you've got what we call first magnitude stars, stars that are our first magnitude or brighter. And you've got, above my head, Rigel, Betelgeuse, Castor and Pollux to the four left, Aldebaran, all right, and Capella. That is six of the 20 brightest stars in the sky right there rising in front of you as you're in your lawn chair with your hot cocoa, maybe a hot toddy, okay? You got your red flashlight so you can look at your star chart and your eyes stay dilated. You got your binoculars because when you put your binoculars on the Pleiades, now that's a close-up view of the, uh, the V of Taurus the Bull, and right at the very top, Marty, is that cluster of stars, and that is the Seven Sisters of the Pleiades, and we will do a show next week probably on the Pleiades star cluster. We do one every year. It's full of mythology. It says Procyon up there, and that's the brightest star in the cluster. And I can see six or seven with my naked eye right now here in the backyard, Marty. But when I put my binoculars on the Pleiades, holy cow, I bet I count almost 30 stars. That's right. This is a cluster of over 100 stars that were born out of the same cosmic cloud and then they're going in different directions in every direction you know what's another star cluster that i know you know the name of that the stars are, are were once like this the the very close together the big dipper the stars of the big dipper used to be tightly packed like that we see the pleiades seven little sisters at night and over millions of years they spread out after and sort of grown up and away from each other like siblings do so 
Well, okay, we we're going to go from the night sky, but you know, Mar Marty, I'm not going to skip any opportunity to talk about the planet Mars. All right, there is Mars in the sky right here, War of the Worlds, yep. So Mars is to our lower left, all right, and, and you're going to see Aldebaran in this V in the Pleiades, and you go, okay, now I get it. I see what Mark's talking about. That's Mars. If it doesn't look real red right now, the higher in the sky it gets going to look pretty red. And then, But it's getting closer to Earth. Tonight, Mars is 50 million miles away. 50 million miles away, all right? That is 200 times further away than the moon. All right, actually, I think it's 2,000 times further away, not 200. Because uh, the moon's a quarter million miles away quarter million miles away and this is 50 million miles away all right but in a week uh two weeks on december 8th it will only be 38.6 million miles away so in our backyards through a telescope you're going to see mars get bigger before your eyes and as it gets bigger you're going to see the surface features look even more prominent yes you can see the surface of mars from your backyard telescope and I'm going to show you some hints of that. And we'll be talking about that in the next couple of weeks. You know it. But only every two years, there's only three months out of every two years that you can see the surface of Mars from your backyard. And that's going on right now. So again, look up your local astronomy club. Find out when they're having a planet palooza like the Brevard Astronomical Society is doing this Saturday. We'll be conducting some... Planet Palooza Mars gazes here at the American Space Museum on our property starting uh, the first couple of weeks in December there and uh, might even do it Christmas week uh, and pull some traffic off Route 1 coming down here and just show them the planet Mars. What does it look like, Mark? Well, I'm glad you asked, but you know what? I was talking to our docent, uh, outstanding new docent that we have here, Gordon Rebello, and he's reading a book about Mars Uh uh, the history of, 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 of looking at Mars and humankind and so forth. And he said, Mark, the early astronomers thought there were canals on Mars and people on Mars, and they're actually responsible, I think, for all the space probes going there and trying to find out if that's true. In all of the movies, in the science fiction and so forth, from, from the early astronomers in the uh, 1800s that thought they were seeing uh, surface features that looked like canals on Mars. Because you can see a white polar cap on Mars, just like Antarctica. And then there's a south polar cap that grows and shrinks. Well, what I'm getting at is, yes, you can't talk about Mars without talking about how it has influenced the mind of Mars. How about that, you old school baby boomers? There's a classic illustrated comic book that I'm sure Tom Usiak probably read that War of the Worlds there. There was a man named Percival Lowell that at the turn of the, of the 20th century, the 1900s, uh, he bought a fabulous telescope. He was a rich blue blood from Boston, loved astronomy, bought the best telescope money could buy. He was a multimillionaire. In fact, his sister's Amy Lowell, the famous poet. And he started seeing canals on Mars and made globes and maps like this. And then he created a whole mythology that this was the a dying planet that was sending us back signals, okay? And uh, this was before War of the Worlds uh, was written by H.G. Wells. But Lowell was picking up on this. He wrote three books. One of them was called Mars, the Abode for Life, Mars and its Canals, and, and another one was just Mars. He was so popular, like a Carl Sagan, or today, like Bill Nye the Science Guy, or... or um, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He, he, was, he was like that popularity at the time. Uh, another astrophysicist uh, would be, um, um, who passed away, uh, Marty, he was in a wheelchair. Oh, uh, name eludes me there. Um, anyway, he was a popularizer of science and Mars in particular and a bestseller, all right, for the concept that Mars was inhabited. And this clinged with us, okay, until this picture was transmitted back by Mariner 4, NASA spacecraft in June 1965. 
I was a paper boy. I ripped open that paper boy on that edition when Mariner 4 flew by, it didn't orbit, took 22 pictures, and there was on the front page of the Courier newspaper in my hometown of Finley, Ohio, was this crater with frost on it instead of vegetation, a forest. We thought maybe there'd be rivers and so forth on there. Now, we have found all the rivers and stuff, but they were flowing about 2 billion years ago on Mars. Or, uh, and from, But this was a photograph, Marty, that really broke the hearts of anybody that felt we had a chance of having uh, humanoid type creatures or any kind of uh, living creatures on the surface of Mars. Of course, the fake radio broadcast by Orson Welles of War of the Worlds uh, in 1933, I think, Halloween, uh, spawned all kinds of, of, of interest with Mars. Marty, how, I'll bet you watched a few My Favorite Martians. Yeah, I watched quite a few of them. Did you? It's been very popular back in the day. It was. It was. Bill Bixby and... Uh, Ray Walston there was in as corny as it was. It was it was a very popular show. He was the only one that could see this uh, this uh, 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 Martian, uh, kind of like uh, the Flintstones had that uh, that Martian guy. What uh, oh what was that creature's name? I'll bet uh, Larry Pusker knows on um, Flintstones Gizmo. I think it was Gizmo. Confirm that for me out there, guys. And if you're watching this show and you have not seen The Martian starring Matt Damon, well, all I can say is uh, go see it. All right. I won't criticize you. Maybe you've just been too darn busy. But one of our ace volunteers here, Connie McDaniel, Connie says she's seen it about 30 times, I think, Marty. She loves this movie. I love it, but I ain't going to watch nothing 30 times unless it's uh, Forbidden Planet, maybe. My favorite movie. But it is a great movie. Only one or two little uh, technical uh, flaws in it, uh, but it gives you an idea how hard it's going to be to live on Mars. But we do live on Mars with robots. These two robots behind these jet propulsion lab uh, scientists there. Uh, the big one is, of course, what opportunity, not opportunity, what curiosity and, um, and now um, perseverance. perseverance look like. Uh, we also have a helicopter that's not in this picture that has, has done like 30 successful flights on Mars. Then to the left, you have the rovers that we had for almost one for 12 years and the other for seven. Opportunity and Spirit. Spirit lasted seven years. Uh, opportunity about 12. Uh, there is a movie called Oppie that I can't wait to see out at Kennedy Visitors Complex next week. Uh, that I understand is quite a, an emotional documentary about this little rover and all that it did. And with the Jet Propulsion Lab team, uh, all of these spacecraft have human beings behind them that have written doctorate th degrees and so forth on what we know about Mars now. But because all of these have lasted longer, including that little one in the front, that is Sojourner, guaranteed to live uh, 90 days on Mars, just like Opportunity, the solar paneled one b behind those scientists, they were guaranteed to work 90 days. Well, one lasted seven years, the other 12 years. This little sojourner, it outlived itself, but it was like the size, as you can see, a, 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 a toaster oven or a big uh, microwave. And that landed, when that landed on Pathfinder in 1996, it's, it crushed the infant internet of NASA uh, down there. So these are the three rovers that we've had on there. Missing there are two uh, landers. The Viking landers of 1976 were actually a lot bit about the size of the, the big rover there. And then we have InSight is on one of the poles of Mars sending back data on there. So Marty, we thought about Mars and have been thinking about it since Chesley Bonestell, the great artist, rendered what he thought would be how it would look on Mars with man uh, being on Mars uh, as early as 1985. The great Werner von Braun, architect of our Saturn V moon rocket, if he would, had his way, he said we could be on Mars by 1985. Well, we're shooting for, we're not shooting for any date. <laughs> we're hoping to be on the moon by 2026 with the Artemis and then maybe 
make plans, but you never know about these entrepreneurs, these billionaire space guys like Bezos and Musk. Uh, they just might go to Mars without anybody in NASA involved in there. At least that's what uh, Musk says his starship is for. Uh, he wants to does not go to Mars. He wants to colonize Mars and have a thousand people or more living on Mars uh, by the end of the of 2030. So will it happen? Probably happen without you and me, right, Marty? Yeah. But while I was out in Arizona, I thought I'd take this picture. Not. <laughs> this is Mars, folks. This is what Mars looks like, like Southwest America out there. A lot of sand, wind, though the atmosphere on Mars is like being on Mount Everest, very thin, one-tenth of the Earth. You need uh, air to, to breathe. Um, and the radiation is going to kill you because there's no uh, ozone protective atmosphere. There still is enough wind and dust to have dust devils. And in fact, we had a global dust storm the last time Mars came around, which of course was 2020. We were getting ready just like we are now to look at the surface of Mars. And guess what happened? A giant gust dust storm covered up the entire surface of Mars, and we couldn't see the dark markings. We hope that doesn't happen this year. But I'm going to be out making sketches of Mars. Uh, Fairville Hartley, thank you for watching. Tanya Titanium, like that. Uh, and Christopher Mick. Christopher's probably looked through a few telescopes and seen the polar caps of Mars. Uh, Daniel DeYoung, I'd like to be flying with Daniel DeYoung, Marty, at night and looking out on a good clear night with him up there. Uh, maybe he'll tell us about that. And hey, Tony Achilles, good to see you, my good friend there. And it's great to have dinner with you at Zarella's not too long ago. And uh, we're going to effort John Zarella, by the way, get him on our program here. So, um, well, like I said, I'm going to be behind a telescope in my backyard making sketches of Mars and making my own Mars map. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. I have a, a chart that I put together. I make a crude little sketch at the telescope kind of as quickly as I can because if you're watching Mars rise up at 9 o'clock and you follow it and get up at, say, 1 in the morning and look at it, the features of Mars are going to move around and you can actually perceive this movement of rotation of Mars within even a half an hour. You can notice that. And that's what's kind of cool about it. You might see white areas on the left that is sunrise on Mars, and the darker art markings are like continents, but they're actually depressions of, of rock that's a little bit of a color contrast against the red desert. So this was 2016 opposition. Couldn't make many sketches in 2018 because of the global dust storm. But over my lifetime, I have turned my sketches of Mars into my own map of Mars, just like this. That looks like the maps of Mars from 100 years ago. So I encourage you, and I put the names of Mars, the, the, the deserts, and uh, Eden, and Zephyria, and Hellas is above the Sirtis Majors, that triangle in the middle. And just like over my lifetime, these features have become familiar to me, and I'm looking at them again now in my backyard and thrilled to see them. In fact, I'm thrilled to show other people them. One of my telescopes, I spray painted a blackboard paint on it so I can, with a, a chalkboard, sketch what I'm looking at. So you can see that at 5 a.m. on June 16th, this was 2020, at 300 power, that is what Mars looked like through this telescope of mine. And... Um, uh, and so we're going to be, I know a lot of my amateur astronomy friends are going to be out there. And Mars mania has started, folks. I'm not going to stop until uh, January sometime talking about wanting you to see the surface of Mars. Because it is the only object in the night sky outside of the moon that we can see the surface of, Marty. We're looking at the cloud tops of Jupiter and Saturn and, and Uranus for that matter. Uh, and uh, Venus is covered in clouds. We can't see its surface. This is it. Now, this is a, a photograph by one of my friends. The polar cap at the top has almost shrunk away, but the one at the bottom is like a haze uh, on there. So, Marty, will we ever find any Martians on Mars, do you think? Yeah. Are you sure? 
Not sure about anything, but I'm quite confident. Okay. All right. Well, we hope that everybody's enjoyed this edition of Staying Star Curious, that you've learned a little bit about stargazing in your own backyard and what you can see, and caught up with a little bit of space history. Marty, who else have we got to thank for watching and supporting our show today? I think we got everybody covered, but I got uh, three comments. Um, Steve Hammond mentioned that the Pleiades is called Subaru in Japan and is on our Subaru is on a Subaru car, which we spoke about that a few months ago. That's excellent. There, thank yeah. you for pointing that out. You look get up behind a Subaru car. The the Pleiades is the emblem for that, and uh, we will uh, discuss that when we do our little episode on the Pleiades. Thank you for pointing that out. Who was that? Uh, that was Steve Hammer. Steve Hammer, thank you, Steve. And Carlton Bailey said he still has the uh, War of the World classic illustration first printing. Oh well, I'll uh, I'll buy you lunch for that, okay, Carlton? Someday, if you want. <laughs> but uh, I'd probably be fun to read. I'll bet he reads it tonight. In fact, we're going to have CB Carlton Bailey on Friday. Marty's going to be doing some personal business, so uh, we're going to do the show ourselves and. Uh, uh, Carlton Bailey, who's been a photographer of rocket launches for over, well, 30-some years, done over 700 launches, he's going to do a day in the life of a rocket photographer for us. So I know you'll look forward to that on Friday with the one and only Carlton Bailey. And what, what other comments, Marty? Okay, my comment, Mark, if we go back and look at that slide about the human orbiting, the humans orbited Earth? Yeah. We have since 1961. Yeah. Well, Mark, I think we must we made a mistake with that. Okay. It's since the beginning of time, since eternity. Oh, you're right. You're <laughs> right. You're right. You're right. I will update that <laughs> since the beginning. And he is. We're laughing because that is what the voice of NASA Hugh Harris said when he introduced the uh, three rocket uh, uh, launch directors: Jim Harrington, Mike Leinbach, and uh, Bob Seek at our shuttle fest in April. Uh, what'd he say, Marty? He said uh, I forget this. Th that they've launched 75% uh, of humans to space in the history of humanity, yeah. uh, of the Earth and so oh, forth. Since, in the four, since the beginning of time, I think he said. Yeah, since the beginning of time. Oh, he said eternity. Yeah, eternity on there. So you're right. Hey, think about it. 694 people in the history of our 4 billion year old planet that we think humanoid's been walking around about a million years of that so all right marty thank you for a great Streamlabs job here like i said i hope everybody enjoyed it i'm going to get back with my little uh, hot toddy here it says marty this was a christmas gift for me caution may randomly start talking about astronomy and you know me well if i'm drinking this mug so until we get under the stars again in our backyard and stay star curious I'm Mark Marquette, thanking everybody for being here today and saying we can't wait to see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us. Back to those Pleiades. <laughs>